we don't succeed at beautiful and powerful diversity by pursuing diversity. You succeed at diversity by pursuing Jesus. That's what the gospel has done throughout history, and that's what the gospel has done in my own life. A real formative time in my ministry life happened right after I graduated from college and I moved into East Palo Alto, California. I tell stories from that time of my life quite often. It was the place where Sonia and I led our first small group together. We were 22 years old. Uh, we weren't married yet. Uh, we were just dating and uh, we launched a, a small group for our church in East Palo Alto, California, which was literally the most dangerous neighborhood in America at the time. I had rented this house and we decided just to invite people you know, over to study the Bible and worship and receive prayer and all of that stuff. Uh, the first meeting, there were seven people and uh, Sonia and I uh, asked ourselves, well, what should we pray for to make this enterprise successful? And uh, both of us will distinctly remember that we prayed for a spirit of fellowship, uh, that whatever else happened, our group would be known for vibrant, loving, godly fellowship, relationships, uh, community. And then the group grew and grew and grew. It turned out that people were willing uh, to come to our house, even though the neighborhood uh, was dubious in, in some ways. And it was uh, inappropriately diverse. It was the biggest and most diverse small group that I have ever had, uh, even to this day, uh, despite its inappropriate setting. We had white people. We had black people. We had Asian people. We had Latino people. Uh, we had wealthy people. We had people who were just utterly impoverished. We had homeless people sitting next to Silicon Valley engineers and corporate managers. We had folks who had advanced degrees from Stanford sitting next to folks who hadn't gotten past high school. The ages ran from about 22, and that was me and Sonia, one of my roommates, to about 60. So it was demographically diverse that way as well. Uh, we had recovering addicts in the group. We had more than one ongoing addict in the group. We had ex-cons who had been imprisoned for drugs, for solicitation, and one or two had been imprisoned for murder. Uh, because of where my house was, and it was a community house, and we were inviting people from the neighborhood to come live with us, uh, we had folks off the street uh, fairly regularly. Uh, we had folks from various sexuality backgrounds uh, that would join the group. We had one atheist who would eventually convert uh, in the group. We had a couple mentally ill folks who found healing in the group. And we had one three-legged cat who would come out of my bedroom only for worship and prayer and then go back in once people started uh, talking uh, to one another. An amazing experience of diverse fellowship and unity uh, for Sonia and me. But here's the thing, we never once in that group pursued diversity. And we never once pursued unity per se. We pursued Jesus without trappings and without complications, with full hearts. And then the diversity and the unity just kind of happened. I just graduated from Stanford and at Stanford University, there was an immense multi-million dollar bureaucracy dedicated to fomenting diversity on campus. Uh, during my years at the university, uh, due to some events that got national media attention, uh, the multicultural movement on university campuses was born right then. Some of you were old enough to remember the multicultural uh, movement. All of that happened during my years at Stanford University. All of that resourcing, all of that a pursuit of diversity and nothing I experienced in college held a candle to the sort of diversity and unity that we found in a small group in my house in a rugged neighborhood in East Palo Alto, California. The spirit of fellowship, the spirit of Christly fellowship is a truly awesome thing. And even though uh, my house was 
crazy, even though I lived in the most violent neighborhood in America, people would visit my house. People would come across the freeway from the rich neighborhoods and come to visit my house uh, on any given afternoon. And they would say to me, I just like to come to your house to hang out. It's so peaceful here. And then you would usually hear automatic weapons fire uh, off in the distance because there was gunfire in that neighborhood every day. But people found peace and acceptance in that house uh, in a manner that I really haven't seen uh, anywhere uh, else, uh, not as powerfully uh, in my life. And, and I drew a lot of lessons uh, from that season uh, but, but, but here's one that I often reflect on and that I often talk about. When people who have no business being together manage to be together in love and power and grace, that's signature Jesus. Jesus can produce communities like that, like no other power can produce communities like that. It doesn't happen by pursuing diversity to express God. It happens by pursuing God simply and passionately, and then the diversity and the unity happen. Uh, we've been going uh, through the book of Acts, uh, and uh, we've been reading uh, about this guy Saul, for one, uh, a fellow who started by persecuting Christians, uh, and then he became a Christian and a minister, uh, he's rejected by everyone uh, because uh, the Jewish politicians no longer like him uh, because he become a Christian and the Christians don't trust him because he had formerly murdered them. So Paul has ended up fleeing to his old uh, family home in Tarsus. We read about this guy, Peter, who is uh, becoming the nominal leader of the church. By chapter 13 in the book of Acts, Peter has been jailed twice already uh, by the Jewish uh, political leaders. And he's had a strange interaction, <clears throat> interaction with a Roman military officer, uh, a representative of the oppressive Roman forces, and has brought uh, that Roman uh, to Christ in an interesting way. What we are seeing in the book of Acts is a theme. It's a theme that unmistakably has to do with, with, uh, with navigating group oppositions with navigating different group identities in the power and grace of, of the Lord, uh, which as I reflect on it and I reflect on our current time, it just makes me think about, well, how would I have managed in their situations? How would I have done? So let's do a warm up question along those lines. You know, let me ask people, if, if you lived under a, a, a really strong oppressive regime, you know, whether it be uh, a religious regime, as with the Jews, or just an op oppressive, exploitive machine, as was the case with the Romans in Saul and Peter's day. If you lived under a regime like that, what good and godly act of yours would you get arrested for? Think about it. I might get arrested for doing something out of protection for people I love. I would definitely, I don't know what the heck an evil regime would be doing, but probably hurting people. And I would be trying to find those people and sneak them out and help them get somewhere else or something. We or I would probably be doing something like housing people secretly. I'm gonna go I, praying in public. Or praying oh, for people praying in praying public. public. That's good. I'm thinking that I might get into um, trouble by uh, because I might want to um, speak out for people that might be suffering or, or oppressed. And um, I'm thinking an evil regime might be in, I don't know, might be not, not considering um, that they really count, you know, that their lives count. So I would think that I might get in trouble for that. We are reading excerpts this week from uh, Acts chapter uh, 11 and 13, sort of following the story um, and taking a look uh, particularly at a church in uh, a place called Antioch, which would have been sort of 
north of Israel, southern Syria, like on the border there. And it has to do with the further adventures of this fellow named Saul and some of his friends. We pick up the story in uh, chapter 11, verses 19 through 26. And this is uh, a little bit after uh, Peter has uh, converted Cornelius. The Gentiles are beginning to be welcomed into the church, beginning to be welcomed uh, into the kingdom by the Jewish leaders. <clears throat> but it is a time, you will recall, of great persecution. The church in Jerusalem was scattered and they went in different places. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. We've heard about him before. He's a, a strong leader in the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. <clears throat> then we get a little story about Peter being thrown in prison. I'm going to skip that and go all the way to chapter 13, pick it up at the beginning of chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, you heard about, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And the two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus, which is an island sort of in the uh, eastern Mediterranean. When they arrived at Salamis, a city there, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. This is John Mark, who would eventually write the Gospel of Mark. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos, there they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bargesus, who is an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a Roman. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind. And for a time, you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Well, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed. Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? For he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. So this is, uh, in some ways, a story about the church in Antioch. This is a church that would become super influential in church history. <clears throat> the Antioch church, as it appears in the story, is a prototype church for us. It's a prototype of a church that sends people out we get this story about how the Lord spoke to the leaders of the church and said, set aside Saul and Barnabas. Barnabas and Saul was the order for the work that I've called them to. And then 
Barnabas and Saul get sent out to new territory, to places who never heard of Jesus. Um, so they are uh, an intentionally sending church. The church had spread around the region through the persecution. People run from Jerusalem because they're afraid of getting killed. And then they preach the gospel wherever it is they happen to be. But this is different. The, in the Antioch church, they intentionally sent out a team to start new churches in new places. So it's a missionary church, snaps for the church in Antioch. We love that kind of thing. And Christian churches have been doing it ever since that Antioch was a pioneer in, in that regard. But before they became a sending church, Antioch had to be a gathering in sort of church. And the first thing that makes Antioch remarkable is the way that it gathered. I mean, first uh, it grew up because persecuted Jews ran there and they preached the gospel to other Jews. So it was sort of a, a Jewish Christian enclave. But it says that some who were there, some people who were of a dis, dif, different ethnic group, although they had probably participated in the Jewish faith, they preached to Greeks. They, they cre preached to people from the other side of the Mediterranean uh, region of the sea. Uh, people who had a Western culture as opposed to an Eastern culture. And lo and behold, the Greeks came to Christ in great numbers. The church in Jerusalem get wind that the gospel is going to the Greeks. They're a little bit interested and concerned about this because, you know, they were still trying to catch up with God's transcultural, trans-ethnic strategy. So they send this guy Barnabas to Antioch to sort of check it out. Barnas, Barnabas checks it out. And I love, I love how it describes Barnabas's reaction. Um, uh, it said, when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord in all their hearts. So when unlikely people, people from different traditions, different races, different backgrounds, different stories, come together in Christ, it's evidence of the grace of God, God's generosity. Something about it uniquely shows the heart of God, and, and Barnabas immediately gets it. He sees this incredibly diverse congregation. Faces of all of these people of different hues, and, and somehow in that he sees the heart of God and the face of Christ. Uh, Luke tells it uh, in, in a beautiful, a beautiful way, and the description of the church that we event, the, of the leadership of the church that we eventually get in in Acts chapter thirteen is just really illuminating. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. You know that all the gifts were at work, so it was diverse that way. There's Barnabas, whom we know about, Simeon called Niger. Uh, Simeon was a, a, a Jewish name, but Niger was a word that literally meant black. He had a nickname, and he was called, you know, Simeon the Black. Uh, he was undoubtedly from Africa, uh, and uh, he wasn't pale like some of the native Jews. Um, he was a dark-skinned guy, and they loved it such that they gave him a celebratory nickname. It's like, yeah, you know. You, uh, Simeon, Simeon the, the black guy, uh, one of the leaders of the church. You get Lucius of Cyrene, so that was also uh, an African territory. So this guy would have been an African who was in a Christian church in Syria. Just, you know, a remarkable sort of transcultural, trans-ethnic group. And Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, so uh, the Herods were sort of Jewish, but they had betrayed their people. Uh, they had been accepted by the Romans. They were sort of puppet leaders uh, of the Romans over the Jews. So this guy was Menaean, who had been brought up in that household, would have been considered a political traitor uh, to the Jews. He was politically undesirable. He was of the wrong class, but he was there, and he was part of their leadership team of their senior leadership team. So I just, I just love that. And of course, Saul is there as well. And we know about Saul. Saul has been accepted by no one. 
uh, so far. Uh, and Barnabas had to go to Tarsus to bring him. He thought to himself, you know that guy Saul that I met years ago? He's right for this church. Uh, because this church belongs to no one in particular, and neither does Saul. Uh, it just belongs to Jesus. And Saul, I remember, as a powerful guy, I'm going to bring him. I'm going to raise him up as a church leader. And, and from there, Barnabas and Saul partner uh, to be church planters. Good story so far. Are you guys digging this? Like it. Yeah. This sort of diversity that is described in this story would have been nothing short of historic. Because in this day and age, in this place, you did not see diversity like this. You did not see this sort of ethnic diversity. You did not see this sort of class diversity. This is pure signature Jesus. Only the gospel creates a group like this. And it was so remarkable that Luke, when writing the history of, of the, the Jesus movement, had to put this description here in the center of the book of Acts just, just to give credence to it. It's like, no, guys, this is how it works. Seriously, it was amazing. This group of people was beautiful. Uh, and I just want us to hold on to this in, in, in this season of a lot of uh, racial and class unrest as we're seeing uh, in, in, this, <clears throat> in this season in America. Um, and, and again, this theme is just being pounded on in the book of Acts. Whenever you turn a page in the book of Acts, uh, there is you know, some remark, some story, some reflection on uh, how the church grew by uniting unlikely people together in the cause of the gospel and the cause of Jesus. We're all children of God. And the book just keeps telling us that again and again. It says that Christianity brings people together. It was in Antioch, this incredibly, inappropriately diverse place that Jesus' followers were first called Christians. This is, this is the group that defined the term Christian, which literally just means little Christ. Um, it is our heritage, and it has always been thus uh, for us. Um, Christianity brings people together if it is operating uh, truly, if it is, is allowed to operate truly. The gospel brings people together in a way that is historic and unique. God's culture transcends all culture. Huh? How do you feel about that? Uh, and then there's a second part of the story, uh, which is certainly entertaining and impressive uh, in its own right. Uh, they uh, take Barnabas and Saul under the direction of the Holy Spirit. They pray and they fast. They do what they can to really uh, set them apart. And, and they set them out for the first time to intentionally plant churches in new territories. So this is a, a big uh, adventure uh, for everyone involved. Uh, they went uh, to Cyprus for whatever reason. They were led by the Spirit to go to Cyprus first. Uh, this island, uh, being an island, it would have been fairly secluded, right? I mean, there are reasons that this place probably had not heard the message of Christ yet. Um, and so Paul and Barnabas, uh, they show up there. And, and first they probably start talking to Jews because they have an easy entree. They show up at the Jewish synagogues. They were Jewish uh, by ethnicity, so that was easy for them. But eventually, as they travel across the island, they get exposed to more and more ethnicities, different sort of people. And eventually, the Roman proconsul, like the Roman like governor of the place, this guy, uh, Sergius, as they would have called him, they, he hears about these guys that are preaching this new philosophy, this new religion. Romans were pretty pantheistic, pretty intellectual people. That, and the guy says, well, I want to hear about this. He calls Barnabas and Saul to stand before him. The problem is that there is this fellow named Elymas or Bar-Jesus, depending uh, on which name was used. He probably had different names depending on which social circle that he was traveling in. And he is described as a Jewish sorcerer, which meant he would have been ethnically Jewish. He probably would have been steeped in the tradition of the one true God, but he had expanded and mixed his spirituality. There's no such thing as a Jewish sorcerer in, in the Jewish religion, right? So he was a Jew who was vaguely religious, who decided that he would become 
pan-spiritual, that he would sort of water down his faith and borrow from other faiths and, and you know, sort of, I don't know what the right term today would be, spiritual but not religious or uh, new age, we used to say not too long ago. Uh, but he was a guy that was just kind of spiritual, maybe claimed to have spiritual guidance, although he would not have prayed to any particular god. And this was very popular in the Roman world. Uh, we saw a lot of attacks from the sort of open-minded spirituality. A lot of attacks came against the early church in precisely that form. And this guy, Elymas, is, is the first example of it we see in the accounts. And he's a political operator, this sorcerer, right? He's, he's a counselor for the governor, and he's bringing him spiritual, ethereal sort of wisdom that's supposed to help the guy govern the island. And when Barnabas and Saul show up, uh, this guy, Elymas, interferes with their story. It's like, no, no, this, you know, they're telling the story of my people, the Jewish people, but governor, don't, don't trust them. They're, 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 they're messing it all up. You know, I'm the guy that you need to listen to. They're not politically acceptable. I am, you know, that sort of thing. You can imagine how that conversation went. And so, uh, and so Saul, uh, who's also called Paul and inserts into the story, uh, Saul um, decides to build a bridge with this Elemis Bar Jesus guy. He decides to have open dialogue and discussion, right? No, Saul throws down with this guy and says, Elemis, um, look, you're, you have forgotten what is right. You are not doing uh, the right things of the Lord. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to be blind for a while. Paul, Saul curses the guy with blindness and his eyes go dark. A mist settles upon him. He can no longer see the sun. And that was an interesting afternoon, I imagine. And the governor is like, okay, that's some for real stuff right there. Uh, I think I'm going to believe what you believe. Tell me more. And uh, historically what happens is that the church in Cyprus grows to be huge. And uh, Barnabas would eventually return to Cyprus and become the pastor there. He would become quite famous and super influential in the in the first century church, one of the chief pastors of all. And uh, he would be headquartered at Cyprus. Um, what would you say about Saul's attitude there in the proconsul's chambers? How would you describe his attitude? Let's hear from the crowd. Confident. Confident. No nonsense, to put it mildly. What else would you say? Familiar with God's leading and voice. Familiar with God's leading and, fo and, and voice. Will willing to act on it without hesitation. Yeah, for sure. Anything else? Authoritative. Authoritative. That's a great word. Well, you can see it also in the <laughs> yeah. It's, it's worth remembering in Saul's story that the way he came to Christ was he got blinded by the appearance of Jesus in the sky, right? And another Christian named Ananias had to come to him to heal him. Uh, so yeah, Saul knows about blindness, maybe a little too much. His confidence and authority, I mean, it's like, you know, you're, you're trying to thwart the purposes of Christ. I will now curse you with blindness and that's how I will handle this problem, deal with it. That's fairly confident and fairly authoritative. In part, you see Saul and Barnabas as incredibly accommodating men, right? Just to accommodate all the different cultures and thought systems and mindsets that they would have had to manage to build a church in Antioch, to be accommodating in such a way that they could go to new territory, Gentile territory, uh, territory that they would have found spiritually unruly. They would have had to have been filled with grace, pretty chill, pretty relaxed. But here is an example of a lack of accommodation in the extreme. Shut up, you're blind now. That is not right. That is not true what you're saying. So get out of my way. I stand on, on what is right. 
It's an epic throwdown. Uh, at some point, you're just going to have to be ridiculously confident, maybe even a little badass about the truth of the gospel. Because the world is an unruly and oppositional place. And you're going to have to wield the truth with a wee bit of authority from time to time. Because that's the only way to tame the storminess that you're going to find around you. There is truth and power in the gospel that you preach. Be comfortable with that. You know, it's great to be nice. But sometimes... You have to be strong. Sometimes you have to be corrective as well. Um, sometimes you need to say, ah, don't say that about Jesus. Don't say that about Christianity. It's not true. And to be willing to stand on that to the extreme. It's always been that way. Either you're going to shake the world around you or the world is going to shake you. And sometimes it's just a little dramatic and violent. And you have to be ready for that. Saul and Barnabas crossed boundaries uh, easily, but they brought truth. And that was a bracing thing. I know how Elemis's punishment fit, right? Because uh, he was promoting spiritual blindness around him. And then he gets struck uh, with blindness himself. I think often this happens as a matter of course for people. Uh, people are blinded by what they themselves say. People often believe their own shtick. You know, they say things as if they're true, and suddenly they are blinded to the truth. You know, what you say and do has powers to block your own vision your own ability to understand. And we all need to be careful about that. So Saul throws down with Elemis, sort of slaps Elemis in a very impolite manner. But he's not preaching to Elemis per se. He's preaching to the proconsul, you know, and his throwdown with Elemis just becomes part of his sermon in a sense, as if to say, what I'm saying is powerful. And of course, uh, the proconsul believes, the governor uh, agrees. From this point on in the story, uh, that uh, our story ended in, in verse 12 of uh, chapter uh, 13. <clears throat> verse 13 reads, From Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem, which might sound like a very innocuous sentence to you, but there are a few significant things in that sentence. One, from this point on in the story, Saul is never called anything but Paul. It's like his identity changes now. There's something about this interaction that happens on Cyprus that makes Saul sort of the refugee Jewish minister into Paul, the, the missionary to the Gentiles. Uh, and, and, and to the Western world, uh, as it were. And then, uh, although uh, the group had been described as Barnabas and Saul up to that point, now the group is described as Paul and his companions. <laughs> so Paul has become the leader of leaders here. It's as if Paul has become who he was meant to be in the calling of God. And it just strikes me that that transformation in his life is a product of his ability to cross boundaries and to be accommodating and his ability to trust in the unique authority of the gospel of Jesus. Those two things together make him an extraordinarily powerful person, a guy that you kind of didn't want to mess with in some sense, not where spiritual things are concerned. You got to be loving, but you got to be ready to be tough and to speak the truth uh, as well. It could make you into, your, into who you truly are if you pull off love and truth together with authority and power. It could make you into who you truly are. Uh, Paul had been a man without community for, for a long time. He became a man who transcended communities. And now here in this story, we see that he's becoming a man who creates communities out of nothing. 
He's becoming a church planter, the greatest church planter in history. How are we going to apply all of this? Uh, you might ask. I don't have fancy things to say, but here are a couple application points. Number one, preach it. You got to preach it. We have a gospel. We have a message. We have a Lord. You have to unabashedly preach it. That was true on Cyprus in the first century AD, and it is still true for us now. The world is awash in chaos these days. Have you noticed? <laughs> Have you noticed? Things are kind of crazy, and I don't think that's going away. We have a virus crisis. Uh, that's causing an economic crisis. This doesn't get reported in the news, but the economic crisis around the world, particularly in the poor parts, is already killing tens of thousands of people. We have uh, an economic crisis. We have a racial crisis. Uh, perhaps you've noticed that. We have culture wars generally. We have leftism versus conservatism, and everything feels like chaos, and everything feels like opposition. You hear that the Christian church has become irrelevant today. Uh, you hear that Christianity is alternately weak or mean. You get that a lot today. You hear that God is dead or that God is dead in the West. You want to you bet? You want to bet? I don't think so. Christianity and the church have been left for dead many times in the last 2,000 years. I wouldn't bet against Jesus if I were you. I don't care how bad the chaos is. So preach the gospel with faith and with unapologetic authority. It still works, and it is the answer. It is. Uh, it has thrived. It has been transformative in more places, across more cultures, and more situations than anybody can possibly count. And it is the thing that brings people together uniquely and powerfully. It is. Which leads to two. Uh, the gospel is still for everyone. The gospel is still what brings everyone uh, together. Jesus is for everyone. So you have to make him the center of things. You have to introduce Jesus to all. Just figure out a way to do it. But introduce Jesus to all. And if you do it wholeheartedly, without a lot of trappings, uh, you know, simply but powerfully, um, then diversity and unity will always follow. Always. How do I know this? Because it's the plan of God to gather people in from all corners, all races, all tongues. We get that promise again and again and again. Jesus does that. The gospel does that. It's, it's, not, it's not oppressive. It's unifying. It has always been uniquely unifying. It has always created a family out of far-flung peoples. I know this to be true scripturally, I know that it has been true throughout history because I'm a student of history, but I know it to be true personally as well because I've seen it. I've seen it happen in strange places with a crazy diversity of people. And God creates beautiful family out of disparate strings of experiences and cultures. The Apostle Paul would eventually say to his churches, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. First to the Jews, and then also to the Greeks. First to the Easterners, but then to the Westerners. God gathers from all corners, all places, all races, all classes, and he gathers them into Christ. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited about it because the world needs the message. The world needs the message. And I believe that God is calling you to preach it and to be a unifying factor by preaching an unapologetic form of Christ and his message. It's a beautiful and healing 
thing. It brings a fellowship and a peace that heals people, delivers people, and changes lives. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that your message would flow through us in all of our facets, to all corners of our island, our country, and our world. The world is shaken, groups are in opposition, but the gospel transcends, unifies, and builds up. We are the people to do it because we are the unlikely people whom you have created. I pray, Lord, uh, for a spirit of accommodation and for a spirit of forceful truth. I pray that we would preach a simple gospel of things that are right, things that are wrong, combined with the grace and forgiveness of Christ. Make us bold in that, Lord. Make us powerful in truth and in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah.